Hey, so today is a big, big day at our church because it's a kickoff of an all new sermon series. The series is called, There's Got to Be More to Christianity Than This. But I've also been sharing over the past few weeks, this is not just another sermon series, but it's actually an all-church small group series where we truly hope that nobody goes through this series alone, but you do so in community, connecting in a small group. I'll be talking about more about that at the end of my sermon. But today is week one of the series. Two weeks ago, if you were here, we had what I called week zero of the series. We want to give people as much time as possible to join a small group. And so I know a lot of you have already done that. A few of the groups are full, but a lot of them are not full. And so we wanted to say today, like, because again, God made us all uniquely, right? And so for some of you, you needed two weeks ago to join a small group. Others of you were thinking, why are you talking about joining small groups two weeks from now? Why are you talking about so far in advance? Well, if, I, if that's you and you're waiting to join, like now is the time. And so please, in the lobby as you leave, there's a table, there's sign-up sheets, there's the half sheet in your bulletin of small group options. And again, just want to invite you to join a group to check out small groups. And so this series, again, there's got to be more to Christianity than this. It's about this fact. When you read the Bible, when you read God's word, you read about people, followers of Jesus, turning the world upside down, living lives to the full, because they are living out their identity in Christ. They're living out, as we sang, who God says they are. But then if you're honest, like really honest, and you look at your life, you might struggle, I struggle, with some of the earliest dreams that you might have had of what your quote-unquote new life in Christ was going to be like, that if you're honest, many of those dreams have come true, but some of them have been far from coming true and have been far from reality. And so you maybe lament and maybe grieve about the struggle of what you see in Scripture of what followers of Jesus believed and did versus what you believe and do. But then at the same time, as maybe you lament a bit, there's something inside of you that's like crying out and maybe just hopeful that there's got to be more. There's got to be more than the life I'm living for Jesus. There's got to be more to be a believer in Jesus and a follower of Jesus than what I'm living. And there's just that, that lake in your, in your soul. And, and the good news is there is more. Like God put that in you, that cry for more, because there is more. There's always more when it comes to God. But there is a battle for that more. There's a battle to experience and achieve that more. There's a spiritual battle over our identity. And that's what today's sermon is all about, the battle. That's what the series is all about. By the way, I'm very glad that the mission youth are in the sanctuary. We usually, at the 11 o'clock service for 6th to 12th graders, we have them go in the youth room behind the barn door off of the lobby, but we just felt as a team that we wanted our youth, our 6th to 12th graders, to be in the sanctuary over these next six weeks because we believe God's going to speak to all of us. By the way, the, one of the reasons why they're in service today is this coming Wednesday, starting this Wednesday, is an opportunity, it's something new we're trying for our youth to be in a small group. And so on Wednesdays, at 6.30, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., you can see it in your bulletin, we're inviting youth to, to, so you come to church on Sunday and then go to your youth small group on Wednesday nights. Just an invitation, if you have not ever been part of, our, of what we do on a Sunday morning with Mission Youth, 6th to 12th graders, this would be a great opportunity. Show up this Wednesday at 6.30 and go back there. We have amazing team leaders, that, and just a great, a great group of teens that we'd love to have you connect with. So if you haven't been connected to youth, check it out this Wednesday, 638, and see what God does. You will not regret it. I believe that. So glad youth are here. They're in the back three rows as well, scattered throughout the sanctuary. But we want to invite you as well, if you want to, starting next week, to sit in those back three rows, to sit together and uh, 
experience the service together. So today's sermon is called, We've Been Spiritually Hacked. The sermon is about the spiritual identity thief that the Bible talks about. But before we open up the scriptures and talk about the spiritual identity theft that we experience, I'm going to jump out of the Bible and talk about how we experience identity theft in the world. This is one of those things that didn't even exist when I was growing up. Being hacked was not even like a verb when I was growing up. But now it is a massive crime. So I'm going to ask a question, ask for a show of hands. How many of you experienced some type of identity fraud where maybe you got a credit card stolen? Don't raise your hands just yet, but I'll ask for a show of hands. Your credit card stolen, maybe a number stolen, some fraudulent purchases show up on your statement. You have to dispute some charges, get a new card issued. Or maybe you got an email address hacked and someone said, hey, are you at, like, are you stuck in jail in Mexico and need like some money sent to me, you know, or something like that? You get an email from someone or maybe your social media got hacked in some form or fashion. How many of you experienced any of those? Hands up, hands up, hands up. Okay, how many of you did have not experienced any of those who are not teens? Because some teens, feel like a few of you, like, like four or five or six or seven, I bless you in Jesus' name. But it happened like 90% of us. This happened to me just, uh, actually, how I started my 2024. It started off with a bang. On January 8th, I checked my email that morning, and when I checked my email January 8th, I had three emails back to back to back from Facebook. Now, my goal, if you've been part of our church, you know I wake up at 4.44 a.m. That's my goal every single day, and I do not start my morning on social media which is good practice. I start my morning with Jesus, like read my Bible, pray, connect with God. But then at some point in the day, early on, I typically will hop on email. And when I did that morning, Facebook thought I had already been awake for quite a while. Because again, I got these emails and Facebook thought I was busy, very busy, very early in the morning that day making changes to my account. And so I checked my email, and at first I'm like, are these from Facebook or not? Because the first email, email number one, sent at 4.23 a.m., was titled, did you just add an email address? So I clicked on that, read about it, and then the second email, sent one minute later, did you just remove your phone number? Email number three, sent one minute after that at 4.25 a.m., did you just remove your email address? So these, all three emails that I clicked on gave a link, gave an option to click, that wasn't me. So I clicked, that wasn't me, that wasn't me, that wasn't me. By the time I clicked on, that wasn't me three times, and I got redirected to my Facebook account, and I tried to log in, I'd already been blocked. And so then, I'm trying to figure out, how do I get unblocked, right? And so... I went to facebook.com slash hacked. Thank you, Alan Lovnow, for letting me know there was such a thing. Went on that, tried to like reestablish my identity. That went like nowhere. And uh, I've been blocked. Well, I had a credit card linked to my Facebook account, so you can imagine what happened. Then I got, hey, have you made these charges? No, I have not, right? It's just a lot of fun. Just a lot of fun. Very much, though, I will say it's first world problems. First world problems, right? had a full stomach, have heat in my house, but it was still frustrating. So I had to cancel that credit card, had to get a new one, still blocked from Facebook, but life goes on. Now, now by, by a show of hands, right, again, some type of fraud has happened to the vast majority of us. But on top of those, again, that is, those are aspects of identity fraud. There's also something known as identity theft. And identity theft is a whole other ball of wax, so to speak, where there are bad guys in the world that steal sensitive information like social security numbers, PIN numbers, and they actually steal or attempt to steal your identity. Well, they don't just make some purchases on your credit card, they don't just, but they actually open up new accounts. They file fake health insurance claims in your name. They file fake tax returns in your name. Happened to my brother, my older brother Doug, who's a pastor up in Sandusky, Michigan, Church of Nazarene up there. A few years ago, I talked to him. He said, yeah, guess what? Tried to file my tax return. And when we filed it, 
got an email that we already filed it. Someone filed a fake tax return, my brother's name, and the government was not exactly super helpful in having them try to get his money. They didn't care, believe it or not. And so it's just frustrating when things that happen. That's, that's like identity theft. And it's a nightmare because what happens when someone steals your identity in that way, now you have an uphill battle trying to prove that you are you to someone who doesn't know you on the other line. And it sounds weird to say that, that you have to prove that you are actually you, but that's what you do when identity theft happens. And it's scary, again, to think that there are bad guys out there who do their best to do that. It's a horrible feeling if you've been violated to that degree. But I want to begin my sermon today to set the stage with those stories to set up where I'm headed. By the way, if you like where I'm headed in the message today and what you hear on the back of your bulletin, there are two books, Called to Reign by Leif Hetland, as well as Robbie Dawkins' Identity Theft. There's other books as well, but I just want to point out two of those really helped shape where I'm headed in my message today. So check those out. So today's sermon, today's sermon is grounded in John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus is speaking about the devil who he calls the thief. And Jesus contrasts what the thief does with what he does. This is the Amplified Bible translation of John 10, 10, where Jesus says this. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus contrasts and says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. So while identity theft is a, is a growing crime in the world, there's, again, a spiritual version of identity theft theft, where the devil steals much more than social security numbers or PIN numbers or credit card numbers. The devil is the thief, and he is really good. He is effective at convincing Christians that they are someone else than who God says they are. And the scary thing is that more than likely, you have already been a victim of his identity theft. You've already had your identity, your spiritual identity stolen to one degree or another without realizing it. And I preach to you as I'm preaching to myself. And if you don't believe that, Let's see how this sermon lands, because I think by the end of it, you will believe, yep, my identity has been stolen to some degree by the spiritual identity, by the devil. Now, to begin to prove that to you, I want to share this key thought. Here's a key thought. Normal, quote unquote, normal American Christianity is not normal New Testament era Christianity. We have blanks, by the way. Part of the small group experience is to take notes in the sermon on Sunday, and then there's some blanks to fill, and that's your first blank at the bottom, the word not. Normal, quote-unquote, normal American Christianity is not normal New Testament era Christianity. So when you think what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow Jesus, and if I said, what behaviors, what practices, what would we do, what defines a Christian living in America, and say I got out a whiteboard and took notes and had everybody shout out their answers, I can imagine here are some things that we would collectively agree on that defines an American Christian. We would say, well, uh, go to church every Sunday. Yes, and by the way, well done, you're here. Check the box. Read your Bible, hopefully every day. Pray every day. Be radically generous with what is given to you through your tithes and offerings and giving back. Connect in community. Don't, don't do your journey of faith alone, but connect in community. Put your faith in action both inside and outside the walls of the church because we are most like Christ when we serve. And so we could just brainstorm out a half a dozen things like that, and there's probably a few more that we would add to the list. But that would be a pretty good summary of what we often think was it mean to be a Christian living in America. And by the way, please don't hear me wrong. All those are good things. It's a good thing that when we do those things, those are good things. So I'm not saying they're not good things. I'm not attacking any of those behaviors and practices. 
because they are a key aspect of living out our faith. But I share that list to say this. When you open up the scriptures, when you open up God's word, you read the New Testament, and you see believers and followers of Jesus living out their faith, there's a lot more than what I just said in a list there. There's much more. And the reason our American version of Christianity is often much less than what we see in the New Testament is because the devil, Satan, our adversary, has stolen our identity. And he does his best to convince us that we're not who God says we are. And in this series, my passion for it is that we need to take our identity back. But it's a battle. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. So that when we, see, when we sing songs like I am who you say I am, my hope and prayer is that sometime in this series, we wouldn't be able to finish that song because we'd be so broken with the beauty of what we're singing. So as we start the series today, uh, I'm going to bring back an analogy that I shared two weeks ago because it's an analogy of three chairs. You might be wondering, why are these three chairs up here? Are these for like people who are like disruptive in the service? You have to sit by the teacher, you know, <laughs> you're like in school. Come on, come on, Bobby, you know, sit here. Nope, the, these chairs are actually uh, a symbol. They each picture a way of belief, a way of life, they each picture a worldview. And at any given moment, any given moment, each of us, each person who has ever been born, ever lived, whether you're, by the way, a believer in God or not today, whether you're a church-going person or not today, we sit in any given moment in one of three chairs. And so I want to reintroduce you to these three chairs. There will be a quiz. This, for the whole series, is chair number one. I want you to say chair number one. All right. We're going to try the next two with a little bit more enthusiasm. This, for our whole series, is chair number two. Say chair number two. Chair number two. All right. Anybody who's been too cool for school so far and hasn't participated, you get one more shot. This is chair number three. Say chair number three. Chair number three. Well done. Well done. It, it built. So this is chair number one. Chair number two. Chair number three. All right. We got it. We got it. I'm going to explain what the three chairs mean in a bit, but for now, I want to go back to the beginning, back to the first book of the Bible, back to creation, because in the creation, there were not three chairs. There was only one chair. There was only one way to live, only one way to exist. So we're beginning in the beginning, since it's the beginning of our series, to the creation, when God created Adam and Eve. There's only one chair, what I'm calling chair number one. Here's what it says in Genesis chapter one. First page of the Bible, verse 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So men and women were made in the image and likeness of God. They were born in what is known as chair number one. It was the only chair that existed at the moment of the history of in that moment in the history of creation. And as I shared two weeks back in our week zero, chair number one is defined where you have like no fear, no worry, no shame. You're seated in chair number one when God is really real to you. You're in chair number one where you are overwhelmed with the love of God. You're in chair number one when you love your neighbor really well. Adam and Eve were perfectly seated in chair number one. Every thought, every word, every action was a chair number one thought, word, and action. I want to now zero in on Adam for a moment. At the moment God made him, I want you to pic- like picture this, enter into this. And I pray, I, I pray in the first service, I was reading this and I was like, you know what? 
it's so easy to read right past the creation account because if you're a church-going person, Adam and Eve, you know, like you have children's Bible, if you're growing up going to church like I did, and you can just like read right past the story and miss the depth and beauty of it. And so I just pray, Holy Spirit, give us fresh ears, fresh ears to hear, fresh ears to hear. I'm going to zero in on Adam for a moment, and then we'll zero in on Eve. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. It's interesting, right? God, prior to that, he simply says, let there be, and there was. And that's how he made everything. And then he switches tactics and gets very personal here. Imagine this. Imagine if you were Adam, and that was you. When Adam began to exist, the first face he saw was the face of God. The first voice he heard was the voice of God. The first feeling he felt was perfect love from God the Father. The first experience he had was was being in the presence of God. Eve has a similar experience, Genesis 2.22. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So what this means, as you read this verse, there's a lot going on here. Eve began her existence one-on-one with God. The Bible does not say how much one-on-one time she had with God, but she had some time with God. So the first voice she heard was the voice of God. The first face she heard was the face of God. The first feeling she felt was perfect love from God the Father. The first experience she had was being in the presence of God. And then only after spending some time alone with God, the text says, then, right, then he brought her to the man. So then Adam and Eve were together, and as they were together, they were both in chair number one. Here's what Leif Hetland wrote in his book, Call to Rain. Adam's original design and condition was to be in the image of God, in the presence and love of God, in in a face-to-face gaze with God, full of God's breath, living in a place of God's pleasure. And he says, why is this significant? Because it tells us about God's desire for us and describes what our chair one position is to be like. When God created Adam and Eve, and the experiences that they had with God, that was what God, that was God's desire and heart for every human being that would ever have been made from that point forward. Where God wanted for them what he wants for us, to live every moment of our lives free of worry, free of fear, free of shame and any other negative emotion. A life where God is really real to you, a life where you are overwhelmed with the love of God, where you love your neighbor as yourself. So Adam and Eve, they're created and they're, they're in chair one. But just three chapters into the Bible, the devil, Satan, shows up in the Garden of Eden in the form of a snake, a serpent. So at some point, right, God creates the angelic and a good angel chooses with free will to rebel, to fall, becomes known as the adversary or Satan. And shows up in the Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent, Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. So he said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan shows up in the garden in the form of a serpent and he causes Eve and Adam, who was with her, the text says, he caused them to question the nature of God and to question their own identity. In sermons, I often give what are called key thoughts I wanted to give you the devil's key thoughts. So be clear, these are not my key key thoughts. These are Satan's key thoughts. They're in your bulletin as well. Here they are. They're twin key thoughts. You can fill in the blanks. Twin key thoughts the devil wants you to think. Is God really good? And am I really good enough? The devil wanted Adam and Eve to question the goodness of God. 
And by the way, since then, same tactic. It's very effective. And he wanted them to question, so he wanted to question the identity of God, and he wanted them to question their identity. Still does the same thing. He wanted them to question the goodness of God. He wanted them to believe God did not have their best interests in mind, that God was holding out on them. He wanted them to believe there was something that was lacking from their lives. He wanted them to think they were not good enough, they were incomplete. And so they took the bait, they ate the fruit from the tree that God told them not to eat, and the rest is this downward spiral of history where sin enters the world. They eat the fruits, and when they did, through that action and choice, chair number three became a reality. Chair number three nowadays represents non-Christians, people who are separated from God. That's chair number three. So easy way to remember it is chair number three was introduced in chapter three of the Bible. So they eat the fruit. Here's what happens in verse seven. The eyes, the eyes of both of them were open. They realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And again, if you have grown up going to church, you know the story, kind of going autopilot, and you have like the picture of the cartoon with, you know, with, with the fig leaves going on. But what's happening here is they, in their own strength and in their own power, are trying to solve a problem. So they, it says, they took action, they covered themselves in their own strength and power. And God saw what was going on. There's, there's a lot of dialogue and context and things that happen. I'm going to skip down to verse 21 because God took action. Verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. A lot of theology in this verse. Details, again, they're super easy to read right past and miss what's happening. When the text says God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them, when you read between the lines, that means blood was shed. Animal blood. Was shed. We know later in the New in the Old Testament, there's the sacrificial system, animal sacrifices, where animal animals were sacrificed to cover sin. And those animals that were that were sacrificed in the old covenant era, the old testament era, were a picture of what would happen to Jesus when he shed his blood. Jesus was called the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And, and so by doing that, by shedding animal blood here, by making garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothing them, what, what happened there, what God was doing, he was not just giving them clothes, he was taking them out of chair three back into chair one, restoring the broken relationship from sin. That's what God was doing. God restored their broken relationship. And, but from that point forward, right, the devil didn't like wave the white flag and give up. He simply changed tactics. And so the devil has done from that point whatever he can for every human being who's ever existed to hack their spiritual identity. He wanted to hack the identity of Adam and Eve and every human being since Adam and Eve so that we would go from being seated in chair number one and having a chair number one existence to chair number two. To chair number two. And when you're seated in chair number two as a Christian, like this seat's a Christian, chair number one, seat two, Christian, chair number two, seat three, non-Christian. So you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, chair number three goes away, but now there's two options to sit in, chair one or chair two. And you can go back and forth. It's not like, I'm in chair one, check the box, don't need this series because I perfectly walk with the Lord. There's a battle, moment by moment, thought by thought, action by action, chair one or chair two. When you're seated in chair two, you struggle with things like fear. Worry, shame. You think thoughts in chair two that don't honor God. 
When you're seated in chair two, when you go through life in chair two, you do things that don't show love to your neighbor, where you judge them, someone does something that hurts you, you choose not to forgive them, you hold grudges and feel good about it. You let the shine, this is so important, you, in chair two, you let the shiny things of the world distract you from God. And there are a lot of shiny things in the world. When you're in chair two, you make plenty of time for social media, your Instagram, your TikTok, your Facebook, but then somehow you don't have time. I just can't find time to read the Bible and pray. By the way, one great thing to do during the season of Lent, I'm doing it fast from social media, fast from surfing the internet, just so much just junk and garbage. <laughs> Seriously. What I just shared, again, is just a handful, like the tip of the iceberg of examples of what it means to be a Christian, to be a, a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, but to be in chair two while you believe in Jesus, to be in chair two while you follow Jesus, where you're not living a chair one life to the full, where you're, not, where, where you're living less, you're living less than what God wants you to live. And the devil does whatever he can to hack your identity, your spiritual identity. So you do things that I just described, which is another way of saying he wants you to live in chair two as much as possible. As much as possible. And stay out of chair one. Now, to be clear again, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were the only two human beings that began their lives in chair one. From Adam and Eve going forward, we were all born in chair three with a sin nature. We were born rebels to God, where God said to do one thing, and we naturally want to do the other thing. As we sang the song, right, we were slaves to sin. We were born slaves to sin. That's where, that's where we were born. But at some point, hopefully this happened for all of you. If it didn't, we'd love to make you right with the Lord today. At some point, you got out of chair three. You accepted Jesus Christ as death on the cross as payment for your sins. And in that moment, a spiritual transaction, you were made a new creation in Christ, chair one. Chair one. But the devil's not done. He doesn't give up the battle. He just switches tactics and one that's just so effective is he has done, I think, a really great job at convincing Christians that this chair doesn't exist. The chair one doesn't exist. That the best you can think, chair two. The best you can experience is chair two, a less than. Yeah, those Bible people, they live chair one at times, but that's, that's just for like the superheroes of the faith. Billy Graham, chair one. Everybody else. Chair two, he wants to convince us that chair one is inaccessible to us. Again, chair one is when you have no fear, no worry, no shame. Imagine if you experience life without those emotions. You're seated in chair one again. Imagine how that God is, yes, you believe in him, but if he's really, really, really real to you, where you're overwhelmed with the love of God, where you love your neighbor as yourself. The devil will do whatever he can to get you out of chair one, to get you into chair two as much as possible. And so again, in this series, we want to take back our identity. There's a battle where we want to see ourselves, see ourselves the way God sees us, dare to believe what Scripture says is true for those who are in Christ, new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. And that's what the series is all about. So as we kick off the series today, what I want to do is I want to focus on the positive. I asked this question two weeks ago. I'm probably going to ask it a few more times in the first few sermons, just to get us thinking, chair one thoughts. So here's a question for you to reflect on. When were you seated in chair one this week? When were you seated in chair one this week? And we need to celebrate those. Not be filled up with pride about those, because that's another tactic of the devil. Let's just focus on how great we are. And when we do that, we go in chair two. But to think about and to celebrate with complete humility, just being honest. When did you bear maybe an aspect of the fruit of the Spirit this week? That's a chair one moment. You need to celebrate that. When maybe did you encounter or experience God's love? When did you reject fear of man? When did you say no to a battle you have? With a sin you struggle with? When did you say no to it? It's chair one. When did you do the right thing at school? 
wherever that right thing is, chair one. When were you led by the Holy Spirit to do something? It's chair one. When were you filled with gratitude toward God? Again, to be clear, you don't have to experience all those things to be in chair one. It's just one aspect. There's a battle back and forth. So I want to invite you to take some time to answer this question, pray this question, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. When did you live out your identity in Christ and you did not allow the devil to hack your spiritual identity? And my goal in this series is that more and more, we would have more and more, more and more chair one moments, more and more chair one thoughts, more and more chair one actions. So that when we ask this question and you're in your small group, when did you have a chair one moment? You're like, let me get back to you on that. I need to think for a few hours. There had to be a moment there somewhere but that it would become just normal because that's what God wants. But as I said up front, this is not just another sermon series. It's an all-church small group study where we want you to not just go through it alone, but to be in community, to be in community where our sermons and our small groups go hand in hand. So today is week one of our series, week one of our small groups. And so in addition to the question I asked you as an action step, I want to give you a few more action steps. Here is the first one, is to make Sunday mornings a non-negotiable. Every once in a while, I share this action stuff. I had a conversation with someone who was in this room, who back probably six, seven years ago, heard me say it, make Sunday mornings a non-negotiable, and she's like, done. And she's at church 51 out of 52 Sundays a year. I'm not going to make eye contact to eye contact with her, but she knows who I'm talking about. But she's like, hey, you said make Sunday mornings a non-negotiable. I can do that. I can choose to come to church. That's like low-hanging fruit. But I'll tell you, COVID happens, COVID happens, and people got out of the habit of going to church every week. We just fell out of the habit. There's a spiritual battle. Here's, here's just a question. Please be honest. How many of you almost, for whatever reason, grace abounds, almost didn't come to church today? Hands up. Hands up, hands up. Thank you for your honesty. One, two, three, four. Thank you for your honesty. There is a battle. And if you raise your hand and you got here, you're an overcomer. You're an overcomer. Embrace it. You're an overcomer. Thank you for your honesty there. But make it a non-negotiable. I'm coming to church. Six weeks for this series, I'm going to do it. And hopefully, then the next series, the next series after that. But just make, come to church. It matters. No matter what's going on the night before, I'm coming to church. So that's your first action step. Before I give the second action step, I want to give a shout out to what made this action step that I'm going to share possible. Thank you to our small group leaders. We have a slide on the screen with a whole bunch of names of awesome people, awesome people who said yes. Yes, absolutely. Come on. If we need some balloons here to get some excitement, we'll bring them back. But seriously, there are leaders and co-leaders that stepped up and said, yes, I will lead a small group. We have 11 small groups, again, in your bulletin. If I can find my half sheet, it's somewhere in here. You have in your bulletin, in your handout. There are 11 small groups. Most of them are still open to new folks, and you can email the leaders directly. We have a table in the lobby. If you're a leader and you'd love to have people join your small group, After church, head out by that table in the lobby. There's sign-up sheets. There's groups that start today. There's actually a group going on right now, the Salmonson small group, Dave and Amy, where if you wanted to switch and go to the 915 service for six weeks, they go to church at 915, and then they're going in the youth room. Since our youth are here, the the, uh, youth room's open, and you could do both back-to-back. The sermon would be really fresh if, if you do it that way, but there's groups. There's, again, 11 groups. There's a group meeting tonight as well. I think Aaron and Jenny's group. So again, check out and step up into community. If your name, again, that's for if your name was not on that slide. Enter into community. But if for whatever reason you can't join one of those 11 groups, the final action step is just to gather a friend or two and become your own small group. Just kind of do it on your own. Maybe you grab one friend of the church, maybe one other household, maybe a few people, a handful of people that you know and just say, hey, do you want to be, a, be in a small group together? You already have the curriculum in your hands. It's the digging deeper questions. 
And so you simply, and this happens with all of our groups, you'll just go through the questions one at a time, and you probably won't have time to get through all of them, and that is totally fine. But this is your curriculum right here. Come to church on Sunday, take notes, you fill in the blanks, and then you go through your digging deeper questions. And you can do that on your own with another friend, family member, and don't despise small beginnings. However you do it, may you do it. We are better together. Amen. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said, though I have come, that they may have and enjoy life, have it in abundance to the full, till it overflows. And the devil is a good thief at convincing Christians that they are something other than who God says they are. And more than likely, again, to one degree or another, you have been a victim of this spiritual identity theft without even realizing it. We are in a battle, and we often get taken on the battle because we don't have our armor. We don't know there's a battle to fight. And that's the reason why our American version of Christianity often looks much less than how Christians lived in the New Testament era. It's because the devil has stolen our identity. And in this series, we want to take it back. I want to take it back for me, for Kelly, for the girls, as a church family. Let's take it back. And let's dare to believe who God says we are. My hope and prayer, again, is as a result of this series, instead of being defined by the first half of John 10, 10, that talks about the thief stealing things like our identity, that we'd be defined by the last half of John 10, 10, that we would have and enjoy life, have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. And that as a result, as a result, there'd be a new normal when it comes to what American Christianity is all about. Amen? Amen. Thank you, God. It's going to be an awesome series.